Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for Modernize Your Music Ministry, discovering digital resources that save you time. My name is Jethro Higgins. Um, welcome again, friends and family of Oregon Catholic Press. We're so glad and blessed that you're here with us this morning. Please pray for me and with me that this time we spend together this morning may be fruitful and a benefit to your ministry. So before we get started, we're just going to talk a little bit about some housekeeping. Uh, for best viewing, it's important that you close other programs or applications you may be running on your computers. That'll really help you with the viewing and sound quality if you, if you might be having connection issues like that. Also, I want to talk a little bit about the questions. On your control panel on the right-hand side, you can enter questions at any time, and we encourage you to do so, so that we have questions answered at the end of the webinar. And um, answers, of course, will be given at the end. And if we don't get to your questions at the end of the webinar, um, we will be contacting everybody who has questions afterwards. So let us begin, as we should with all things, with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Just before our Lord's passion, he prayed that his church would be one. Listen to the words of Jesus from John chapter 17, verses 16 through 21. They do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. Consecrate them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. And I consecrate myself for them, so that they also may be consecrated in truth. I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Lord Jesus Christ, your heart desires the unity of all believers. As we continue your work in the world, consecrate us in your truth, that we may be one as you and the Father are one. In this, the year of mercy, help us to find the words and the means to speak your truth to the world in new ways, that those who listen may find their hearts open to receive you. Help us to take on the spirit of the new evangelization. Amen. So you might be wondering why I chose um, this reading and this prayer. And part of what we're going to talk about today is um, obviously the title of the webinar is Modernizing Your Music Ministry. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the pushes and pulls we have in our ministry as far as being modern and um, also the new evangelization. We want to make sure we're striking a balance between these things, and we're going to talk about that a little more in a bit. Again, thank you for being here. My name's Jethro Higgins. I'm the website manager of OCP.org. Normally, I'm the one driving these things um, and asking the questions at the end, but today I have my friends Daniel and Claris here with me uh, taking care of that end of things. I'm really excited to be speaking with you <clears throat> about digital media and the liturgy today. But let's talk a little bit about myself first, you know who I am. My primary vocation, of course, is to be a husband and a father, and I'd never pass up an opportunity to share a picture of my brand new baby girl, Isabella. There she is in the middle there. I've been involved in music ministry and youth ministry for a little over two decades. It all began when I started singing for our parish choir when I was 10 years old. And that love of music ministry grew into leadership roles, which eventually led to director of youth ministry and music director positions at several parishes in the Archdiocese of Portland. Currently, I serve as the Life Teen Music Coordinator and Youth Ministry Coordinator at Our Lady of the Lake Parish in Lake Oswego, Oregon. So we'll talk a little bit here about what we're going to cover today. First of all, um, we're going to spend a little bit of time building a case in favor of adopting digital media in your ministry. Now sometimes this can be a pretty hard sell in our parishes, so it's important to be able to back up this type of shift with support and guidance from church documents. Secondly, I'm going to give you some tips for reverently incorporating digital media into your ministry in your parish in a way that serves the liturgy. And third, we will go over how to get the right digital resources for your parish. And then finally, we'll have some time for question and answers. So don't forget to enter your questions into the control panel again on the right side of your computer. Um, I've been through this process of developing and, and uh, bringing on digital resources into a ministry before, especially with um, 
some of the struggles we have within our parish, convincing people that it's the right move, as well as a little bit of anxiety and fear over how to incorporate digital media um, when you're not comfortable with using it. <clears throat> so before we get started today with the actual content, I just want to have a poll question and ask you guys, which, if any, digital media do you currently use in your ministry? <clears throat> Maybe you use digital downloads like eBooks and PDFs, or you might subscribe to a digital library like the Spirit and Song Digital Edition or the Breaking Bread Digital Music Library, which we'll be talking about a little later in the presentation. You may be reading music from mobile devices or projecting lyrics to your assembly. Some of you, I suspect, aren't doing any of these things, and that might be why you're here today. So we're just waiting for a few more of you to, to mark your votes. And it's looking like a lot of you aren't actually using any digital resources in your ministries. Um, so we're glad you're here. Thank you for joining us. And many of you also are, um, are using ebooks and PDFs. Um, that's kind of a good starting point for incorporating digital resources into your ministry. So we'll. Uh, I think you can see the results there. Um, you'll see that mostly it's um, people who are not using digital resources and then ebooks and PDFs. And a few of you are using digital music libraries as well as projections and tablets. So good, we have a good balance this morning. So many of you, um, especially those of you who are not using digital resources, um, may believe that bringing technology into the church is bad, it's scary. So we got these scare do not use circles. <laughs> However, the church teaches um, what the church teaches on this topic is not quite as simple as that. So we're going to build a case uh, in favor of, of using new technologies within the context of the liturgy. Um, to do that, we need to take a brief trip back in history. Some people may have seen the title of the webinar and thought, Modernize Your Music Ministry. That sounds an awful lot like modernism, and I'm pretty sure that there's a papal encyclical denouncing that. And you'd be right. Pope Pius X wrote Pascendi Dominici Gregis as a response to the modernist heresy, which Webster defines as a tendency in theology to accommodate traditional religious teaching to contemporary thought and especially to devalue supernatural elements. But is adopting technology in the liturgy modernism? No, it's not, because our friend Webster also defines the verb modernize as to make something more suited to present styles or needs. The new modern Roman Missal 3rd edition is a perfect example of the church showing us how to, make, how to take on the spirit of the new evangelization and make something modern without falling into the error of modernism. It's all about your hermeneutic, or theory of interpretation. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI challenged us to look at Vatican II with a hermeneutic of continuity rather than a hermeneutic of rupture. A hermeneutic of rupture would be modernism because it is a theory of theological interpretation that suggests that there are various interpretations of what is good and right and that during Vatican II, the church just chose to split with the previously held view of what is good and adopt a new view of what is good. This would seem to pit Pope Pius his views on modernism at odds with the new evangelization. And there are people who would like to lump digital resources and technology into this hermeneutic of rupture. But that argument doesn't really hold water. A hermeneutic of continuity holds on to the one truth of Christ expressed by Pope Pius X and simultaneously seeks out new methods of expressing that truth in the new evangelization spoken of by Pope John Paul the Great expertly modeled for us in the way Pope Francis seeks out the lost sheep. For those interested um, more on this topic, let me know in the survey afterwards, and I'd be happy to send you a link for an article that goes into great detail on this topic. But we're here to talk about digital media and the liturgy, so what does all this have to do with building a case for using digital media in the context of the liturgy, you might ask? Well, simply put, it's a matter between doctrine and discipline. 
when, what kinds of objects and tools that are admitted uh, for use within the liturgy is a matter of discipline, not doctrine, with some exceptions. There are some well-established disciplines in church history related to the liturgy that have changed over time. For example, it used to be the norm for people to bring their own bread and wine for consecration, and a, the addition of pews in the church is a relatively new concept as well. Polyphony also had a period of exile from liturgical use. I'm sure there was also some, no small amount of discussion about adopting electrical fixtures into the design of churches, and for well over a millennium, the assembly didn't have a missal or a hymnal in their hand during mass. It's a lot like this, uh, this tree here. What makes it a tree would be, as a church talks about doctrine, it grows and develops over time, but it stays a tree. What makes it a Christmas tree is the decorations, but without the decorations, it's still a tree. The decorations don't make it a Christmas tree. The fact that it's a tree does. But weren't projectors banned from churches in 1958? Well, yes, they were. Uh, according to paragraph 73 of De Musica Sacra, De Musica Liturgia, and at that time, with the projection technology available for use, this made a lot of sense. Projectors of the day w would have been wildly distracting. There was clicking and whining as the projector ran and light flickering. But more importantly, projectors in 1958 would have been a novelty in a church setting, much like a 3D hologram would be in church today. Its novelty would have made the projector itself the focal point instead of the liturgy. That, of course, is no longer the case. Projectors and digital displays are so commonplace today that the average person doesn't even think about them while they're using them. During the Second Vatican Council, the document Musicum Sacrum, Instruction on Music and the Liturgy, rearticulated the disciplines set forth in the 1958 document without the restriction on projectors. But more than the document refers to itself as a continuation and complement of the Constitution on Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium. And that document gets really interesting around paragraph 128. So I'm not going to read this, this whole paragraph for you because it's actually quite long. But here's the, uh, the Spark Notes version. The canons and statutes involving material things within sacred worship are being revised. Canon law, which applied to the liturgy, is to be brought into harmony with the reformed liturgy or else abolished. It's up to each conference of bishops to adapt these laws as needed to the customs of their regions. So basically, it's up to the bishops to decide what is appropriate for us in the liturgy and for their region. So we have to look at what guidance we have from our bishops. Many US dioceses require an annual archbishop's message to be played on a video in the church. And many, if not most, churches all over Asia project lyrics because pew books are just not practical for them. My wife's own home parish, uh, National Shrine of St. Joseph in Cebu, the Philippines. Hey, everybody in Cebu. Um, they have 15 masses on Sunday and seven daily masses each day. And they use a reader board with red letter text to display the lyrics. And that's pretty commonplace around uh, the Philippines. Another example is a document available online from Christ Church, New Zealand. And it articulates how projection is to be done in churches of their diocese. So it would seem that bishops all over the world with the authority appropriate to them in the light of the Vatican due documents have decided that the ban on projectors from 1958 no longer applies. Furthermore, we have this document from our own bishops conference in the US called Built of Living Stones, Art, Architecture, and the Worship, and that's from the year 2000, which indicates that provision for electronic media should be incorporated into the initial design of a new building fit into the architectural design and should be made inconspicuous. Consideration should be given to the effect of light on projected images. This clearly shows that the usage of digital media within the church, especially the US church, is not only permissible, but should be encouraged in consideration before even undertaking the building of a church building. So some of you might be asking, what does this mean for tablet devices and reading sheet music on tablet devices? Well, the document from the USCCB doesn't specify what type of digital media. It doesn't say projectors. It just says provision for electronic media. That could mean a lot of things, LCD screens, even tablet devices. We don't have any official guidelines from the USCCB on how to interpret this statement on electronic media within the context of the liturgy. But OCP has been asked to include this disclaimer on our ebook products. The disclaimer reads, please note the USCCB does not currently approve tablet devices for liturgical use at AMBO slash pulpit. 
So it's safe to say that our bishops don't want to see iPads in the sanctuary just yet, but there's no reason that um, there's no reason to object to the reading of music from a tablet device, providing that you're not leading music from the amb or the pulpit. So let's talk a little bit about the advantages of using a digital device for your sheet music. <clears throat> First of all, having all of your music library at your fingertips empowers you to be spontaneous in your ministry. God forbid something tragic should happen in your community as, as many of us have experienced as of late. But if it did, you could make a last minute adjustment to the music you have planned for liturgy or quickly and easily put together some comforting music for an unplanned impromptu prayer service. You have your entire music library in a very tiny space rather than managing half a dozen binders of music. You can simply grab your tablet, which contains thousands of pieces of music. We used to refer to the um, Spirit and Song 1 and 2 as a pack and go resource for retreat leaders and itinerant ministers, meaning that everything you needed to run a liturgy or everything you needed for your music ministry on retreat or out, out of the building is there. And your tablet is now the truly universal pack-and-go resource in that no matter what group in your parish community you're serving, your tablet device can be all that you need to bring uh, for your mu music ministry in that setting. Also, with a tablet device, you can quickly order your whole set so that you can simply continue turning pages without fumbling through different books and resources. Of course, many people do this with binders of physical music, but then you have to keep track of the photocopies, and you have to make sure you're not violating your print license agreements. And of course, if you're missing a piece of music, you have to hunt it down. With a tablet, all that hassle of shuffling paper goes out the window. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has lost untold amounts of sheet music because they didn't get transferred back into the big binder from service binders, and are probably lost in a sea of fast food wrappers in the back of a car somewhere. Sheet music apps, like the ones I'm going to suggest um, you know, a little later in the presentation, um, enhance the experience of using digital music to save you a significant amount of time in organizing your music library, among other things. Musicians and singers using tablet devices, also, they can't lose or forget to bring a piece of music. I mean, they could lose their tablet, which would be tragic, but <laughs> they can't lose a particular piece of music or not remember to bring it. And even if they did for some reason, um, they could get it just in a heartbeat by going online. This way they don't have to borrow your keys and go into the parish hall to use the printer or photocopier to engage in questionable copyright activity. Because tablets can be used in a variety of liturgical and non-liturgical contexts, your ministry um, can save additional time by incorporating your tablet device into other parts of your ministry. So for example, you could manage your schedule and email updates about that schedule. You could revise set lists of music um, from one location on the go. That creates a lot of efficiencies in your work. There's an added benefit of doing your in the trenches ministry and your planning for ministry from the same device. So let's move on to some tips for actually incorporating digital music into your ministry. These tips will help you save time, but also they'll help you stay organized. And in a moment, I'm gonna walk through some app options um, that you might wanna consider downloading for your digital music library. You'll see why these tips are key to setting you up for success when you see those apps. So when we talk about tips, um, if you're going to start using a tablet, you should be doing more with that tablet than simply reading digital sheet music. That's definitely helpful, but there's more to it than that. Set lists are really what makes your digital music library tick. A set list allows you to select songs and place them in order for each liturgy, or even so that you can simply flip through your music without having to shuffle things around. So that set list features in most music reading apps, and it's really key. Another key feature is bookmarks. Uh, these two items really work together um, to provide you the most benefit. Bookmarks let you treat each song within an ebook as a separate entity, a separate song, just like your individual sheet music. This allows you to go directly to the song without opening the ebook, and it allows you to put a song from an ebook into your set list. Using bookmarks with set lists, you could pick four different songs, for example, from four different ebooks and flip through them as if they were all in the same binder. 
Annotating your music is also relatively simple uh, in most music reading apps. If you want to write in some dynamics or some changes or even breath marks, it's simple and the software remembers the annotations without actually saving them on the file. Uh, it'll be a huge help to you. So with these three points working in concert, see what I did there? You could take the first page of one song and the second half of the third page of another song and do a mashup, say for example, Holy God, we praise thy name. And then you want to end it with, And holy, holy, holy is his name. You could easily make your music read just like that without destroying the originals or altering them in any way. So to get the full potential of using a device, consider this. You can save text notes and add them into your library. This is particularly handy uh, if you were doing an event like a retreat where you will be talking and leading music kind of simultaneously. It's also uh, pretty important to fill out all of the metadata for each song in your library. It'll take a little time to set up at first, but you'll thank yourself later when you can easily find songs by artist or topic within your library without looking at another resource. A lot of this metadata will come in naturally into the app when you upload your, um, your sheet music to it, but you might want to customize it. Uh, find a page turning strategy that works for you. It can be really difficult at first to navigate page turns if you're not used to using a digital device, but there's several options out there to help you. You can buy a foot pedal to turn pages with both of the apps I'm going to suggest in a moment. You can also set up a gesture so that waving your hand or something in front of the device can turn pages. And of course, you can use the built-in feature, which is to tap on the screen on the left or right, which will flip pages forward and backwards. Uh, take some time to try this out and find the best solution for yourself. It's different for everybody. And once you get used to it, you'll probably find that page turns are actually a lot easier to negotiate with a tablet than actual music. So we'll start by just giving you some of these uh, free PDF reading applications. Um, these are all free to download. And we know they work relatively well with reading PDF files produced by OCP. Some of them have some more advanced features like switching to night mode or a limited annotation feature. And of course, again, they're all free to use. Um, but I'd really recommend paying a one-time fee and getting an app that is designed to work with sheet music in mind. Regular PDF readers don't have the kinds of features that really use your time and energy most efficiently. So let's talk about a couple of recommendations that I'd like to offer you um, for music reading apps that I think will really get you headed in the right direction. Of course, there's other ones out there. Um, so this is a starting point for adopting digital resources. Fourscore is a one-time purchase of $9.99. It offers all the features I mentioned two slides ago as far as set lists and bookmarks and annotations. <clears throat> it has one drawback, though, which is there's no built-in night mode. That's not really a showstopper. Uh, for those who are regularly doing adoration services or candlelit prayer services, it is nice to be able to invert the black and white on your screen so your music stand isn't a beacon of light in the darkness. The great thing about Fourscore is that you can actually purchase music directly from the app and save it right into your music library for immediate use. Because the really robust bookmarking feature, this is really the best way for using ebooks. Um, you download your ebook and you can divide it up into, into different songs with different metadata so it's easy to find and sort. So I'm going to quickly show you what the app actually looks like. So we'll start by, um, here we are on the OCP.org website and say you're going to buy this Respond and Acclaim 2016 ebook. So you purchase it and you download it and then it's easy to upload right into the application. In the set list view, you can see the set lists that I've set up easily, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, here you can see all the bookmarks that I've set up uh, for each individual Sunday and ordinary time. And then here you can see the actual metadata for one of those bookmarks I can add artists, composers, labels. I can even get it a difficulty rating, um, what key it's in. Then you can also um, browse music by composer, genre, or alphabetical in the library. 
And then in the set list view, I can see the set lists I've set up and easily edit them on the fly, which is really nice. And then I can add songs directly to one of those set lists from the song itself by checking the little box at the bottom of that screen there next to 26 Sunday of Ordinary Time. And of course, um, there's many helpful options um, available. This is what the music actually looks like when you're flipping through and those options are there on the top. Um, you can make those top tools go away, but if you click on them, you'll see those options there. So you've got things like metronome, pitch, tuner. Those are all really um, good ways to get started. You don't have to bring your pitch pipe or your tuning device. And then there's also a whole lot of options for importing and editing your sheet music there on the right side. And one of those options really saves time, and that's the ability to purchase the new music like I was talking about directly from the Fourscore app. So if you click on that um, store button, you find the screen on the right, and you can click on publishers and find all of Oregon Catholic Press's music that's available right there. That's really helpful. The next app we're going to talk about is for Android. Um, it's called Mobile Sheets Pro, and it's a little bit more expensive. It's $12.99, but again, that's only a one-time fee, so you're not going to have to be paying that over and over again, and it really helps um, with the organization of your music. Some of the benefits of Mobile Sheets Pro is um, are missing that are from Fourscore, and that um, primarily is the, is the uh, bookmark feature. Um, the bookmark feature is really helpful, so if you're going to be using ebooks and you have an option, I would go with Fourscore. But the Mobile Sheets Pro is exceptionally useful for digital music libraries, and I'm going to talk about that here in a second. The night mode's also built in, which is super helpful, and you'll see that as well. And it's a lot easier to upload files directly to the application um, on the Android version. That's mainly because of the way that uh, Apple products work. It's kind of difficult to reach into your files and, and get them to upload to the app. It's much more accessible in the Android version. So we're going to walk through a little bit about, um, about the app. So we'll start with the uh, licensing online. Um, my parish is blessed to have both digital edition of Breaking Bread and the digital edition of Spirit and Song. And so we can use them interchangeably, which you can see here. I've got um, a song from Spirit and Song and a song from Breaking Bread Digital Music Library, and I can put them into one set list, which is super helpful. I email that out to my ensemble, and they can select there at the top what type of resource they're looking for, and boom, all they have is the downloadable versions of the <coughs> keyboards for the songs that I've selected. So they get that link and they download them. And then right here you see in that import button on Mobile Sheets Pro, you can just hit local file and find your downloads, which is a lot easier. And then you can view all your songs there on a list and easily access them and search. You see all those search options from any of the metadata fields. And that's what the metadata fields look like on the right side. You can fill all that stuff out. The really um, nice thing here is you can identify artist or composer. Um, sometimes they're not the same and Fourscore doesn't give you the option to differentiate. And then this is what the set list feature looks like. Um, your running list of songs is there on the right. You just drag them over. And then you can reorder them on the left side there. And this is what it looks like when you're actually flipping through your music. Again, you've got tools on the top and bottom there, which if you click on the middle of the screen, the tools go away. Um, and it, you'll see that I've got it in night mode here, just so you can see what it looks like. This is particularly helpful for things like adoration services, which we do pretty frequently at, um, in retreats. When you're trying to look at your music and get cues from the priest in a dark environment and you're looking back and forth between a lighted music stand and a really dark figure of the priest, you can kind of go blind. You can't really see what's going on. But in the night mode, it doesn't affect your retinas so bad. So you can actually see what's going on and follow along with your music. It's super helpful. So. Now that we've covered tablet devices, let's shift our focus a little bit and talk about projected lyrics in the liturgy. We'll start by talking about some of the advantages. For starters, there's a large segment of faithful Catholics who will naturally feel more engaged with the liturgy when their worship aid seems to engage them. Um, a lot of our younger Catholics have this experience. A worship aid like projection creates a feeling of the liturgy reaching out to them and impacting their lives. 
It makes the liturgy feel more like a dialogue rather than a performance. With projection, you don't need to interrupt the liturgy to direct the assembly on what to do. So you're not shouting hymn numbers from the pew or, um, or giving directions. They can see all of that from the, the projection, which lets you focus more on the music and doesn't interrupt uh, the liturgy. And for the less musically inclined people, it can be difficult to follow along, especially if you're on, say, line five of the verses of Pangea Lingua, and your eyesight's not so good anymore, and you got all that text stacked up. It's a lot easier just to read a slide with the words on it. And finally, projection provides an opportunity to involve more people in your ministry, the key addition being a projectionist. Um, that's an essential role, I feel, for a parish that chooses to adopt projection. It's important when adopting projection at your parish to come up with a strategy for how to do it effectively. Um, here's a couple of starting points. The focus of the mass should always be the liturgy and not the worship aid. And to that end, it's important, um, like the Build it, Built of Living Stones document says from the USCCB, um, to ensure that projection equipment is tastefully incorporated into the architecture or place it in an inconspicuous location. Even with the best intentions, projection can certainly be done in a way that detracts rather than enhances participation in the liturgy. Um, I just want to take a moment to stop and um, say if you have any questions, please feel free to send them over in your control panel. Um, we'd like to look at them and, take a, and be able to sort them so that we can answer them at the end. So if you're thinking of any questions right now, um, just go ahead and enter them so that um, we can get a hold on them. So to help minimize distractions, consider projecting directly onto the wall rather than on a screen. And the reason for this is that screens take up a lot of space, first of all, and they remain distracting um, even if there's nothing being projected on them because they're still up there. Um, when, a, when you're projecting on a wall, if the projector's off, it's, you're just looking at the church. Only project what is necessary. So projecting the words of the Our Father, for example, is probably not necessary. In that instance, projection could be more of a distraction than an aid. You'll have to find the balance in your own parish because people are at different levels. And I wouldn't want to say one way or the other what's finite there, but I would recommend only projecting text. People learn melodies pretty quickly, but without lyrics, even the second verse of Here I Am, Lord, gets a little, I the Lord, da 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 da. Um, don't project the readings. The main reason for this is that it requires a license from the USCCB, and they don't provide such a license. Slides should be black with large white text in a readable font. Comic Sans and the Eucharist, they don't go well together. Uh, this is also a great time to mention that rotating gifts and clip art probably don't belong in your liturgy slides. Black slides will not only help extend the life of your projector's lamp, which is key if you're going to look for longevity, but black slides also appear to have a transparent background when projection, um, you know, if you're using an assembly version, you've got a big white box with black text and, and notes on it, and that takes up a lot of space and is distracting. If you just use the lyrics, it's much more subtle. It'll really help with time management if you complete all of your foreseeable slides at one time before beginning to insert them into a slide deck for mass. Then only rarely will you need to create new slides. Save all your slides for songs on a desktop folder in alphabetical order so that they're easy to access and swap in and out of, of different um, liturgy slides. It'll be even better if your projectionist has the slides completed before Sunday. Um, so there's not a last minute shuffling that's distracting not only your ensemble, but also the congregation. And keep it to one verse or refrain per slide. If the verse is long, consider breaking it up over multiple slides. More slides is a lot less distracting than tiny little text. Um, again, that same point, don't try to limit the number of slides. Use as many as are necessary to keep the text readable from the back of the church. And of course, make sure that you're prepared for alternate usages of the projector. An excellent example of this from our own diocese here in Portland is the annual Archbishop's Message, which is a video to be played in each parish. These types of things are infrequent, so it's important that someone is trained on how to run that smoothly. Which leads me to my next point. Establish a ministerial role of projectionist. 
This person should be trained to leave time for prayer before Mass when the projector is on the black screen. He or she should understand the projector's role in serving the liturgy, and that's why training is very important for this role. I worked at a parish one time where the standard practice for multiple music directors um, was to simply grab the first college student you could find <laughs> to run the projector. And this was frequently a problem for two reasons. First of all, they hadn't set up the slides, so they didn't know the right timing for transitions, and they often had to flip back and forth during the liturgy. Super distracting. <clears throat> but not only that, everyone started coming to Mass late so they wouldn't be the unlucky victim of my gaze from the piano while I held out the projector controller to them. So let's move on a little bit to the actual resources that you might be using with, um, with these pieces of technology. And there's three primary types of resources uh, from OCP where you can get your content for incorporating digital media into your ministry. Those resources are ebooks, PDF sheet music, and digital music subscriptions. So OCP offers a range of ebooks, including missile accompaniment ebooks, three hymnal ebooks, two psalm ebooks, four Spanish ebooks, and an ebook called Chanting on Our Behalf, which is geared toward teaching the presider, um, the presider chant parts. It's perfect if you're working with your pastor to try to include more chant in the liturgy, and you can learn more about that at um, ocp.org slash ebooks. Uh, sheet music comes in a lot of types, a lot of flavors. Um, the easiest way to find what you're looking for is to search or browse for a song on ocp.org. When you click on the title of the song, you'll find yourself on a page with all the various options available for purchasing that song. Click on the drop down to sort instrumentation. Just be sure when you are using music purchased from OCP that you have a license to use those songs. You can get a license at www.licensingonline.org. If you're not familiar with licensing, it's a site that uh, manages over 50,000 copyrights from more than 250 publishers, and it includes all of our OCP copyrights. So also available at licensingonline.org are our OCP digital music subscriptions. I'll just touch briefly on each of them. You can follow one of the links below to watch a full webinar on each subscription by visiting ocp.org slash webinars. You can see all the webinars, um, as I mentioned earlier. I use both digital subscriptions in my parish, and they really work well together in concert. So Spirit and Song All-Inclusive Digital Edition. Um, right off the bat, the digital edition brings you value with a universal license. So you have license to print as many copies as you want, use songs as many times as you want, and you don't have to report anything, which is very helpful. Uh, the assembly and text files help you put together worship aids for your parish or create your slide deck for your projection. And the playlist feature, which you saw earlier as I was demonstrating the apps, the playlist feature is really where I get most of the value. Um, when I choose the songs I want for a particular liturgy, I get a link which I can share with all of my ensemble members where they can go to download the guitar, keyboard, vocal, which, whichever version uh, makes the most sense for their role, including the projectionist. And all uh, the versions available for a song are compatible, so you don't have to worry about different keys or one file missing, um, you know, missing the third verse or anything like that. And the subscription comes with everything available in the Spirit and Song product suite, so all the accompaniments, all the recordings, all in one place, no reporting, it's, it's really useful. <clears throat> and the other digital um, library is the Breaking Bread digital library. It's a bit different. You still get everything that's part of Breaking Bread, including all the accompaniments, the assembly editions for uh, the worship aid of your choice. But you also get more mass settings with Breaking Bread, and you get Respond and Acclaim as well. Everything you need for your ministry and the libraries update each year with annual changes to the missile program, so you get the new music annually as well. Uh, for more information on either of these subscriptions, I encourage you to contact the email address on the final slide of our presentation today and ask about the program of your interest. I also wanted to say a little bit about some of our digital resources that I haven't mentioned yet, and those of course at ocp.org we have mp3 recordings of most of our songs that are available for purchase as sheet music. Um, this is particularly helpful if you're using sheet music in one of the apps that I suggested. A lot of people get a lot of benefit from listening to the song while they look at it, and you can add that mp3 into the app so that you can play it right from the app when you're looking at a piece of music, and that's super helpful. 
Also, I want to talk a little bit about liturgy.com. It's a huge help for liturgy planning. Um, it couples nicely with our ebooks and the digital subscriptions that we've been talking about. You can get suggestions from the resources that you use in your parish. I really encourage you to, uh, to take advantage of that. And you can create a PDF order of worship so people can see clearly um, what's coming up and what's ordered. You can see the readings. It's, it's very helpful. So with that, we want to open it up to some questions. I think that Daniel and Clarice have a couple of questions from you all. Yeah, thank you, Jethro. Um, a lot of great information today, and I think you're going to save me at least 15 minutes a week at choir rehearsal. I, I, I know I have to go 15 minutes early just to sort my music, get the papers out of the file, put them from one folder to the next, and if I had that, um, I think, a, a new tablet um, with an e-reader, I think that would save me a lot of time. In fact, one of the first questions we have is how can music directors use these apps to share their music with their choir members and musicians? Is there a way to, to send out these electronic versions to them? That's actually a really good question. Um, and I'm not going to answer it directly because as far as having sheet music in the app itself and sharing that, um, there's not a feature that does that. However, if you're using the digital edition, you can send out that link um, that you create from your playlist on licensing online. And then once you send out that link, all of your ensemble members can click on it, select whatever uh, role they have, and download all the music they, they need. So you can't do it in the app itself, but uh, we've provided the opportunity for you to share that information from licensing online, and they can access everything. So with that, speaking of the digital music libraries, is there a way to copy your music from the digital library into Fourscore or another application so you can use it in those apps? How does that work? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So as far as um, a direct interface, like download all of the music to my Fourscore app, that kind of relationship doesn't exist. But it's, it's really easy, um, like I said, when you're in your digital editions, when you download those files to your downloads folder, you go into the app, you hit the import button, and you can upload them straight into the app. So it's, it's one extra step, but it's actually pretty simple. OK, great. Another um, question we're getting a lot from people is, is there the ability to transpose sheet music in any of these applications, like with an ebook? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I haven't seen that feature in any of these apps. Um, I don't know if any such of a feature is in development. Uh, we do have um, low-key versions of some of um, the sheet music that's available, so there's that option. But as far as being able to transpose within the apps, I don't, I don't see any uh, option to do that in any of the things that I've been looking at. And there's a couple questions of clarification here, like what's the difference between a tablet and an iPad? Are those, are those different things, or how does that work? That's a great question. Thanks for that question. Um, so a tablet, an iPad is a type of tablet, mm -hmm. but iPad is just Mac's version, the Apple version of a tablet. There's also Android tablets. There's the Microsoft Surface tablet. They're just a tablet device, which is looks just like the screen on your computer with no keyboard. And that's what a tablet is. iPad's a particular type. Yeah, and then what's the difference between an ebook and a PDF? Is that a different thing, or is that the same thing? Also a great question. Thanks for that question. So um, a PD an ebook is a type of PDF. When I talk about PDF sheet music, I'm really talking about just a single song, so the guitar version of Here I Am, Lord. Um, an ebook, as far as the way that OCP uses them, collects all the songs from, say, a hymnal or um, a choral resource or your missile accompaniments all into one file. So you buy one file and you upload the whole file into your app and you get all the songs at once, which kind of piggybacks on the question you asked earlier. You can't do it with a digital subscription, but with an ebook, you could get you know hundreds of songs from your program all in one upload. All right, well that's that's great, and and then with um with these you know new devices like this, what accommodations do they make for people whose eyesight's not quite as good as it as it was? It, are are we able to read the music on these small screens? Is there any um, provision for helping people whose eyesight isn't quite as what it used to be? That that's another fantastic question. Um, First of all, all of, your, all of your tablet devices, or all the ones that I've used, which is mainly Android and Apple devices, have accessibility options built into their settings. So you can make some of those adjustments for eyesight in the actual settings of the tablet itself. But there are some other settings. The night mode is one that I was talking about. Um, sometimes night mode might be easier to see for people. And you can zoom in on your music as well. It's touch sensitive. So 
Um, if you're only going to be playing like one sheet of music, you can make it a bit bigger. You can also buy a different tablet, and I know that's quite an investment, but um, some tablets that are made especially for Android and Microsoft, they make larger versions. Um, so it's like looking at a bigger piece of sheet music. Awesome. Here's a question that's um, kind of more technical. Like, can you expand on what digital, I mean, what metadata is and how I use it? You were mentioning that in one of your slides. What is that right. metadata? Yeah, metadata, that's kind of a difficult concept to get your head around because in a lot of ways, it's kind of an internal file structure thing. But really what it is, is it's all the information that describes the file that you're dealing with. So if you get you know, a guitar version of A Rightful Place from Steve Angrizano, as far as the computer or tablet's concerned, it's just a file with a number. But you can go into that file and give it details, like this file has an artist of Steve Angrizano. It's three minutes and 50 seconds long. Um, it has a genre, it has a style, it has a difficulty level. And you can add all that to the back end of the song so that when you're searching for it within the app, you just type in Steve Angrizano and there it is. It shows up and you don't have to worry about it anymore. So that's really what metadata is for. It's to help you navigate your music within the app. So we've got a question about the Spirit and Song um, digital music library. You said that you could email um, lists and things to people, but a customer wants to know, do you really don't have to report usage of a particular song? Is that Absolutely. true? Absolutely. That's my favorite part. I mean, you get, you get into the nuts and bolts of ministry, and it's kind of difficult sometimes to step back and, and do that reporting. And we've heard that um, from multiple customers, which is why when, when we created the digital editions, we made sure that the license didn't include reporting. So we find other means to make sure that our composers are uh, paid fairly for royalties. But you don't have to do the back end work of typing in how many times you used it. You just use it. And that's, that's one of the benefits of having a digital edition. Uh, uh, along those same lines, this, um, this viewer um, is writing, my parish has many people in the music planning and leadership roles. Can everyone directly access the digital music library? Yeah, that's a good, um, a good question, great question. Um, you can't access from one, um, from multiple email addresses, but with the license, it's for your whole parish. So anybody in your parish can use it. If you were to log in with info at your parish, all of your music directors and ensemble leaders can use it. They can make their own lists. They can send it out to all of their ensembles, and that's all part of the license. Let's see if I understand this question. Uh, they want to know, does a choir member have to pay a licensing fee if they have music on their own tablet? Does a choir member have to pay so, a licensing fee? So I think fee? that means like if, we, if you have a um, sheet music, do they have to buy a, a license for each person to use it in the choir, for example? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And it kind of gets into the in intricacies of copyright law. I want to preface this by saying I'm not a copyright lawyer. That's not my area of expertise. But I'll take a stab at this one. Um, when you have a file on your device or on your computer, you are given a license to use that file yourself. Um, you can't copy that file to another device owned by somebody else. Um, that would be violating your license. And just because you have the file on your tablet, on your computer, or printed out in sheet music, that doesn't include a license to actually use that piece of music in a liturgy. Now, if you have a digital edition, you already have that license. You can use anything you download as much as you want, wherever you want. But if you're buying individual PDF sheet music, you're gonna need to make sure that you have a license that goes along with that. Like I said earlier, if you go to licensingonline.org, there's a bunch of different licensing options, annual, monthly, and you can kind of sort through and see what's right for you to make sure that everybody who's produced this music is being fairly compensated. All right. Do ebooks have bookmarks or other tags that la allow you to search by the content, like a specific word? Like I wanted to search for Easter, for example. Yeah, that's another great question. Um, I did mention that a little bit earlier, but there's a little bit of an intricacy to it. In Fourscore, you absolutely have that option. You download your ebook. You can even have it automatically search for um, for the different beginning sections of each song and make a bookmark for you. And then you can go in and edit all that metadata we were talking about for each one of those bookmarks. So you can add the artist, add the difficulty for each bookmark within your ebook. The Mobile Sheets Pro app doesn't do that as well. You can create bookmarks, but you can't 
add metadata information about them. So it's a lot more difficult to navigate through your bookmarks and use them, um, which is why if you're going to be using eBooks and you have an iPad or an Apple device, I'd really recommend getting Fourscore. Okay, we've got another question. We project lyrics for the hymns. Can we also display the melody line for the assembly? That's a great question. Um, again, I want to reiterate that I personally find it a lot more helpful to only project the lyrics. Um, it's a lot less distracting. However, if you want to project the assembly um, editions, the digital editions include that in the license. So you could project those assembly editions. You don't get the same sort of license with ebooks or PDF sheet music. Um, you'd have to look into your licensing agreement to see if it includes assembly editions. Um, but that's my best answer to that is if you're using digital editions, yes, um, but I wouldn't recommend it. Let's see. Are there functions um, of the liturgy.com built into the digital music libraries? Is there functionality from liturgy.com built into the digital music libraries? That's um, another fantastic question. Um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, so I can't say too much about it, but maybe I've said too much already. I think we have one more question coming in. Wait Just no, a second. One more question. Yeah, as far as that, that last question, um, uh, we're constantly working to um, react to your feedback and you've given us a lot of great feedback as far as the way that you'd like things to communicate and the way that you'd like to use our products and we listen to that feedback very um, very detailedly and we take a lot of context out of it so if you have that type of feedback please share it with us because it helps us um, make sure that we're providing the best for you all right, this is a great question. Um, I purchased OCP Music on my computer. How do I transfer that to my iPad or tablet device? That's a, great, that's a great question, too. And what I was mentioning earlier about it being easier to do that on Mobile Sheets Pro as opposed to Fourscore, iPads have a different way of interacting with the files on your tablet device. In an Android device, you can just go to the menu, find your files, and, and interact with them. But iPads kind of lock things down a little bit more, so you need to um, upload it through a service on your, on your iPad. So maybe like iPhoto or something like that, and then the app can see the files there. So it's, it's kind of a two-step process, and if you go to Fourscore, they have a, a walkthrough to show you how to do that. Um, it's a little bit too detailed to go into right now, but go to Fourscore's um, app description and look at their um, helpful information. Well, we've only got a couple minutes left, and um, it looks like we've burned through your questions. I think a couple more are coming in, but um, we're going to um, go ahead and answer all those questions offline. So any questions that you did, didn't get an answer to today, um, if you've asked them either in the question panel or in the survey, which you're about to fill out, um, know that we will be contacting you um, and helping you with that. Again, if you have any questions uh, for me, feel free to enter those in the survey as well. Um, we want to make sure that we're being as helpful as we can for you, and we really want to listen to your feedback. So um, please do ask questions. So again, I was telling you that if you're interested in either of those digital editions um, or any of the other content that we talked about in the webinar today, please contact us. You can call us at 1-888-260-7206. And there's the email address I was talking about, productspecialist at ocp.org. Call or email us, we will respond. Um, we love getting uh, calls from you. We love being helpful. So please do call us or email us and let us be helpful for you. Um, the webinar um, and the, uh, both the slides and the video are gonna be available um, this week on uh, ocp.org slash webinars. We'll try to get that up as soon as we can um, so that you can watch it again or possibly use the slides. Some of that helpful information at the beginning um, might help you in conversations you're having with pastoral counsel councils or your pastor on how to adopt digital resources. Um, so that's all going to be for reference for you at ocp.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is October 26th at 9 o'clock a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, again, same time. And it's going to be entitled, How to Run a More Effective Choir Rehearsal. 
It's super helpful. We've got a lot of feedback from pre previous webinars about choir rehearsal, and so we're very pleased to offer you this webinar. Please do go and sign up for it. Um, again, the survey is uh, going to pop up here as, as soon as our webinar is over. It's been a pleasure talking with you this morning about digital media in your ministry. I hope it's been fruitful for you, and my family will be praying for you tonight that your ministry may have been blessed by the time we spent together this morning. Thank you again, and God bless.